Hi, uh, this video is about my Lights Divert microscope. It was built in the 1970s and I've been using this microscope for probably the last 20, 25 years. I have hundreds of hours of eyepiece time on it, mostly looking at pond water in phase contrast. <clears throat> and I thought maybe it would be helpful for people that are new to the hobby looking for a microscope to see one of these from this era with a little bit of discussion about it and help you make a selection of what you would like to get. I'm not suggesting you get this microscope. I'm just, you know, this is indicative of the era of the 1970s. It's very well built, extremely well built, and it's a wonderful microscope. The first thing you'll notice is that it's an inverted microscope. So the light source is here. The light comes down, goes through the condenser. Your slide would go on the table here. And then the objectives are below the table. And then the light comes down, goes along here, and then up to where the eyepieces can magnify the image that's formed by the objectives. This particular microscope is made for a 170 millimeter finite tube length objective. The finite tube length objectives are older and you'll find them throughout the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s. These finite tube length objectives, they create an image directly that the eyepiece magnifies. Whereas the modern infinity corrected objectives, they do not make an image for the eyepiece. You have to have another lens downstream that makes that image uh, for the eyepieces. So we're not talking about infinity corrected here. We're talking about the old, you know, 170 millimeter, 160 millimeter finite tube length objectives, which are by far cheaper than the infinity corrected ones that you can also find on eBay, or you can buy them brand new if you want. This microscope was made for 170 millimeter tube length. And normally the objectives in an upright microscope, the objectives would be pretty close to the eyepieces. And so the objectives will make that image that the eyepieces then magnify pretty close to the eyepieces themselves. Now you can see with these being 170 millimeters, they're gonna come down here, they're gonna hit a prism and start heading this way. And you know, you're gonna to get to your 170 millimeters like right about here. So in addition to a prism here to divert the light this direction and a prism here to divert it up, there's a couple relay lenses inside which then take that image that was formed 170 millimeters away from these objectives and, and uh, make that image show up where it's supposed to uh, here for the eyepieces. We'll talk more about the finite tube length objectives in a bit when I go through the types of objectives I have. The upshot though is that on a microscope that has what well, that's designed for 170 millimeter tube length you can also use the 160 millimeter tube length objectives. So that means you have a wide array of objectives that you can use on these old uh, microscopes. You can put Nikon objectives on here, Olympus objectives, Lights objectives, Zeiss objectives, and they're all going to work uh, quite well. And we'll talk a little bit more about the difference of 170 and 160 uh, later when it comes to uh, preserving the ultimate resolution you can get through the microscope. So we've got the light uh, from the light box coming down, hitting the condenser. In this case, it's a Lights Hein condenser, which is an absolutely phenomenal condenser. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Goes through your slide, which will be down here on the table. Goes through the objective, which you've selected. You can select objectives by turning the nose piece and waiting for the click. And then it comes down, goes through the relay optics, which are only there for an inverted microscope, and comes up 
you can look at the image with the eyepieces. The, you can focus. There's a coarse focus knob here and then a fine focus knob. So you can do very precise focusing with the fine knob. Normally you see inverted microscopes that are set up with long working distance objectives, which means the objective, the focus of the of the specimen on the slide from the objective has a much longer uh, working distance. And that allows you to put like little petri dishes in here with cultures in them and such. And they would be combined with a low NA uh, condenser, and, and which looks quite different than this setup with the light box here, which is a 50 watt light box. There are 100 watt ones available, uh, but I seem to get along fine with the 50. And then this Hein condenser, which can go all the way up to a numerical aperture of 1.4. Just a note on using slides with the inverted microscope. Here I have a diatom slide and you simply turn it upside down and put it onto the uh, focusing platform. And even if you have a drop of water and a cover slip on it, the cover slip will hold just fine onto the slide uh, when you turn it upside down to put it on the inverted uh, microscope. I also have these slides which I call uh, chamber slides and they have a cover slip glued to the back of them and a hole drilled through the slide itself and so it makes a little well so you can just stick a drop of water onto these and then just place it directly on the uh, on the focusing platform and then this gives you the cover slip towards the objectives uh, which is uh, what you want. So for high magnifications you're basically looking at stuff that falls close to the bottom of the well so it's near the cover slip. This works out uh, pretty well. I have glass plugs for these that I can drop down on to kind of squeeze the water out and force everything close to the cover slip but I find at that point you might as well just put a drop of water and use a standard cover slip and turn it upside down on the rig. But these are very handy. I use them quite a bit, especially at lower magnifications where you can see up through the whole well uh, with a lower magnification. So photomicrography is pretty important to me so I need a good flash setup. And One of the nice things about an inverted rig is that there's lots of distance between the light source and the condenser. And so here I've uh, made a little PVC holder for a beam splitter. And the beam splitter is set up so that it's 70% transmissive. So 70% of the light from the light box gets down to the condenser and it's 30% reflective. So when I need to uh, take a picture, I usually have my uh, Godox 8200 uh, sitting on a tripod right out here and when I'm ready to take the picture I simply have the remote control uh, for the camera set up on the camera and then I have the I use the PC sync port to go into the flash and so I need to take a picture uh, I've got it set up so that uh, when it's in focus in the eyepieces it's in focus on the camera and I simply hit the shutter button and I get a flash and the picture is taken. So I use these uh, Nikon 15 power HKW uh, eyepieces and the reason I've chosen 15 power is because that gives me the same field of view in the eyepieces that I have up on the uh, film plane or the sensor plane. And yeah, their H means High, uh, they're high eye point, so you can use them with glasses if you need to. K is compensated and W is wide field. Compensated in this case means that I think the eyepiece has some compensation for the 160 millimeter uh, sort of matched objectives. Uh, but I find mixing them with lights is just fine. <clears throat> While I'm here, 
Uh, I should explain this old camera adapter that I have. It's an old Nikon EFM unit and I don't know if it was built in the 60s or 70s. Uh, I'm just not sure. Uh, it has a periscope which with you know was designed for a film camera. So uh, you could use this periscope and get it parfocal with the film plane. So you could just look through this eyepiece and when it's in focus in the eyepiece, it will be in focus on your film. But you don't need to do that with modern digital cameras because you just uh, use the magnification on the display if you need to do any uh, manual focusing. It also has a mechanical shutter release and it has, uh, I think, a little photo sensor unit in there so it could also tell you what exposure you needed. I don't need that anymore either. So even though I don't need a lot of the main functions of this, it acts as a nice structure to provide projection onto the uh, sensor plane. The thread at the top of that was an old M39. So I found an M39 to Minolta adapter and this Sony A99 uses the old Minolta mount. So that's worked out pretty well. I went to a lot of trouble to get that sensor plane par focal with the eyepieces. So I know when it's in focus in the eyepieces, I take a picture, it's in focus at the camera. Uh, just taking a little look inside of this adapter here. It ha I have a uh, five power uh, Nikon eyepiece in here. Maybe it's a photo eyepiece, but I'm, I'm not sure. But it, it works fine. Uh, so that goes in there. Then I, at the top, there is a lens down here, and if you turn that around, I'm running out of cord length. Let's see if I can get this out of here. So that says Nikon. There's a lens here, and if you turn it around, you'll see it says one half power. So we have five power down here, a half power here which means I'm running two and a half power to the uh, sensor. And there are some more modern solutions to project the image up onto the sensor plane, but this has worked out so well that I just haven't replaced it. It's been fine. And then to get uh, the camera system par focal, I got an old lights adapter for the trinocular tube here. Come on out of there. Hopefully I don't drop this whole thing. And that had a thick flange in there, uh, but I've uh, milled it down and carefully worked it down until I could get the uh, camera image parfocal with the eyepieces. And that's just a standard lights part. You can find them on eBay uh, pretty readily. So that's my uh, flash setup. And if I'm taking video, I tend to just use the light from the light box. Here's my set of uh, old objectives. Uh, four of them are PV objectives. PV was light's designation for phase contrast and they were specifically designed with the Hein uh, condenser and these have higher numerical aperture phase rings than on the later versions called FACO which I'll show later and very thin uh, phase rings and the Hein is designed to work with very thin phase rings, and I guess that reduces haloing that you get from phase contrast. So the first one is a uh, PV10 power with an NA of 0.25, so 
So I got my glare here, so maybe if I spin it, you can see it. They're all 170 millimeter uh, tube length objectives. The 10 power has this oil cap on it, and the oil cap, when placed on the end of the 10 power, gives it the same working distance as the oil objectives. So if you need to set up the oil observation at high magnification using low magnification first, you can pop this cap on and do it that way. The next one is a PV20 power with an NA of 0.45 and then there is a, a phase APO. So the APO lenses are corrected chromatically for four colors and spherically for three. This is a really nice APO 40 power objective. It's also got an L on it for long working distance. And if I spin it all the way around, I think it'll tell me the NA, which is 0.7. It also has a collar for cover slip thickness correction. And then I have a PV, another APO. It's an oil, 90 power, and it's 1.15 NA. This is really a very nice objective. Uh, both these APOs are, are really nice. And then there's a bright field APO, pochromatic uh, objective with cover slip correction collar. It's at 40 power, and it's as high as you can go without oil. It's uh, point nine five. So out of all these, the only one that requires oil immersion is the 90 power uh, PV. I recently got a set of much newer uh, lights phase objectives. They changed their tube length to 160 millimeters, which you can see there. They dropped the PV designation and they went to FACO. FACO uh, has lower NA phase rings than the PV and they're much thicker. Uh, but again, the Hein condenser can handle these just fine, as I'll show later. So I have a 10 power. Uh, these are, uh, which is uh, 0.3 NA, and I should say these are all Flotar lenses, which means they're semi apochromats So they're not quite as good in some respects as the APOs, but they are uh, much more affordable, especially if I was to get new APOs in the same genre. But you can still get those old APO uh, objectives uh, at very reasonable prices. The second one is a 25 power and the NA is 0.55 and I have a 40 power and an NA of 0.7 and 100 power oil at an NA of 1.32 and <clears throat> these stay on the rig these days uh, almost uh, completely. <clears throat> I also have a couple other fluorite objectives which I really like. Uh, this 70 power is an oil and it's an NA of 1.15 and it's a FACO, but it's not, uh, it's still 170 millimeters on the tube length, whereas all these newer ones are 160. So it's an older objective. Uh, but wow, it is really a nice objective. Also, have, take this 10 power out. I have a Flotar 6.3 power with an NA of 0.2, and it's also 170. 70 uh, millimeter tube length. This is really a beautiful objective. <clears throat> One thing you'll see is that the new objectives have a much longer uh, par focal distance from the shoulder to the working distance. I think there are 45 millimeters, whereas, and it looks like this uh, Flotar 6.3 has the same uh, working distance. Uh, but you can see this oil 70 power flotar is made to the old parfocal distance, which is 
38 millimeters. So if you try to put this one on the same nose piece with these newer uh, flow tires, you, you can't use it very effectively because it doesn't want to sit at the same location. And lights fixed that by making this thing called a pleasy adapter. It has a lens in it and it takes 38 millimeter parfocal objectives and makes them work with the 40 millimeter one. So you can then put them on the same nose piece and use them together. There's two flavors of pleasy. There's the normal pleasy and then there's the blue uh, pleasy and it has uh, better throughput in the blue. So I tend to use it with the uh, fluorite uh, objectives and I use the normal pleasy adapter for other objectives. Then I have <clears throat> one more uh, 170 millimeter objective. It's another fluorite. It's oil and it's 54 power with an NA of 0.95 and again I have a pleasy adapter on it so I can use it with the uh, longer 45 millimeter parfocal uh, newer flow tars. Again a really nice objective. Now we'll take a look at uh, the condensers I have uh, for this microscope. The first one is the Hein condenser and it was designed and sold starting in the 1950s. It creates a thin annulus of light with a completely variable numerical aperture for that annulus. So you can fit that annulus of light into any size phase ring in the NA range of the condenser. <clears throat> it's really nice. It came in two versions. One has a circular collar, which this one is not, for the older uh, microscopes, probably the black enamel ones. Uh, and then the, for the newer microscopes, of which the Divert in the 1970s fits, it has a dovetail connection for the condenser fork on that unit. You adjust the NA of the thin annulus using this control lever here. Then you can put the oil cap on it and then if you oil it you can serve up I think it's 0.5 and it goes then all the way out to 1.4. It is really a versatile uh, condenser. So you don't get true bright field with it if you use it with bright field objectives. You get what's probably best called circular oblique so you just have a thin ring of light. So it's easy now to do dark field with this because you just make the numerical aperture of the ring larger than the numerical aperture of the objective. So it does circular oblique, it does phase, and it does dark field. It's kind of a do-it-all condenser. Uh, really clever design if you look up the manual for the Hein condenser it's it's really amazing this is the part of the condenser that uh, is closest to the slide to the object you're viewing it's extremely concave I don't know if you can see that here and then right around the edge is a thin annulus that is not black and that's where the ring of light comes out of if uh, I do want to look just in bright field, I have it's called the lights flip top condenser. So it's got a flip top. This is a dry condenser only. And uh, when the top is flipped, it will go to a uh, uh, numerical aperture of 0.9. And it has a condenser aperture in it. Also, it's fit with the dovetail for the condenser fork on the divert. A Nikon Brightfield 
condenser. It's got a huge oil cap on it. It's an Aplanat 1.4 Iris. It's a beautiful uh, bright field condenser and you can see the other side of that oil cap. <laughs> That's really incredible. It's like a section of a golf ball. And it has a ring on it with the uh, lights dovetail. So I can use it on this uh, microscope also. And I have uh, one more condenser which is a very old condenser. I don't know, maybe it's from the 50s. It has, other than saying uh, it has a numerical aperture of 1.35 with its oil cap. It has no other markings, whether it's Nikon, Zeiss, lights, kind of has a lights look to it. And it is a Nicole Prism polarizing condenser. And I have a a small uh, polarizer disc under the nose piece of the microscope that's on a slider and uh, so I can use this uh, to uh, look at polarization. There's no wave plate or anything. I can just cross the polarizers between this Nicole prism and that uh, disc of uh, polarizing material I have under the nose piece and it produces some pretty nice results. And I guess this had to have been built, I would guess, before uh, sheet polarizers were invented and had, uh, you know, at least 50%-ish throughput. Because uh, otherwise I don't know why you would uh, cut and make a Nicole prism uh, when you could just use a piece of polarizing material. And that tends to be how I do... Uh, polarizing stuff on this rig is I just uh, I have a disc uh, polarized disc that I stick on the top of the hind and then I use that uh, analyzer that's on the slider under the nose piece uh, but this is kind of an interesting historical piece you can rotate plane of polarization which rotates the uh, Nicole prism in here and then there's a thing to lock down the angle when you get it where you want it. If anybody knows anything about that uh, condenser, I'd really love to hear about it. I've done a lot of Google searching and haven't, haven't come up with it. Next, I'm going to uh, do some demonstrations of adjusting the uh, annular ring of the hind. And I'm going to use this uh, centering telescope here. So it's got a sliding mechanism on it. You take an eyepiece out and you put this in place of it. And then you focus the back of the objective uh, through the uh, telescope. This particular one is a uh, Zeiss centering telescope. And you can then image the phase ring at the back of the objective and you can adjust the centering of the condenser to get the uh, annulus from the hind concentric with the phase ring in the objective and then you can adjust the NA of that phase ring uh, so that you can fit it uh, into the uh, phase ring in the back of the objective. Uh, so for that I'm going to try to get video through this centering telescope and through the main uh, camera system uh, simultaneously so you can see the effects. So now I'm going to do, try to do, a demonstration of adjusting the light ring NA on the hind with a phase contrast objective installed. Uh, in this case it's 40 power. I have a diatom on the main image and on the inset is the image through the centering telescope at the rear of the objective. Right now the NA of the light ring from the hind 
is inside the phase ring of the objective. So this is a low and a circular oblique mode. Now using the adjustment knob on the hind, I'm going to move the light ring into the phase ring. So now the light ring is in the phase ring. So the NA, is, as much as I can see on these tiny displays, the NA of the light ring from the hind is the same as the NA of the phase ring. Now I'll keep going and we'll now get outside of the phase ring. So we're back in circular oblique mode and we'll keep increasing the NA of the hind light ring until that light ring I got a little miss pucker ah, there we go had a bit of an alignment problem on the inset camera so I'll continue to all right so now we're at this location where the NA of the light ring from the hind is right at the highest NA that the objective will accept. And you get some very nice coloration effects here just by wiggling that light ring just inside and outside of the NA of the objective. And then if you keep moving it, the light ring is now at an NA higher than the objective and you go into a dark field mode. And then you can continue to adjust the NA of the light ring and there you get to a very bright uh, dark field. So it allows you to fine tune the NA of the dark field illumination to give you the best result that you're looking for. Now we'll head back to bring that light ring back to the uh, NA of the objective. Still have a bit of a centering problem on my camera here. I'm trying to whoop. That's pretty close. And now you can uh, change the centering of the light ring that the hind is producing. And you can get some very interesting coloration and 3D effects here. So it's kind of a moon shape, thin uh, sliver of light illuminating the diatom right at the edge of what the NA, the objective, will accept. I can go back to getting it a little more centered here. Then I can decenter it in a different direction and change the location of that sliver of light. And then in addition to that, you can then adjust the NA of the ring. And if you play around with this, you can get some really nice 3D and coloration effects. Just kind of winging it here on these tiny displays. So I'll center the light ring back up on the objective. And then we'll go back into circular oblique. And then back into phase contrast. And then try to get back into a low NA circular oblique mode. Often when I've got the uh, light ring at the edge of the NA that the objective will accept, you can get results that are probably superior to phase contrast depending on what you're looking at. 
but it provides a lot of variability in the way you want to illuminate and, and get the you know, 3D effects and contrast. So now let's uh, take a look at that change in tube length and its effects on resolution uh, between 170 millimeters and 160 millimeters. For this I'm going to this book by Roger Loveland that he published in 1970 called Photomicography. It's really an amazing book full of all kinds of information. If we go to page 54, he has this diagram of what's going on. And here's the image plane, or the object plane I should say, where your slide is. So there's the condenser, there's the objective, and so your slide is here. And then the objective forms an image of the object uh, at an aperture in the eyepiece. Now for a 170 millimeter tube length objective, this distance here is 152 millimeters. For a 160 millimeter tube length objective, this distance here is 150 millimeters. So the difference in effective tube length, as far as the optics are concerned, is 2 millimeters and not 10 millimeters as 160 versus 170 implies. Now the question is, is that a is that a problem? So a few pages down, he has this graph which has the NA of the objective running here and the acceptable change in tube length that does not result in a change in resolution. And in order to assess the resolution, he put a pinhole in an opaque slide and that's sensitive to spherical aberration. For this line here is for oil objectives. And for an NA ob uh, oil objective of 1.4, the acceptable change in tube length that does not result in a degradation of resolution is 2 millimeters. And that's exactly 150 versus 152. So you can use those uh, NA 1.4 oil objectives interchangeably between 170 and 160 millimeters because their change in tube length is 2 millimeters. And then for lower NAs, the acceptable change in tube length that doesn't result in image degradation becomes quite large, so you don't even have to worry about it. But where you're interested in working for the highest resolution for the objectives you have at NA of 1.4 in oil, that change of 2 millimeters in tube length doesn't result in a change of resolution. <clears throat> the place where you get into trouble is on this other line for dry objectives. And again, uh, the change in tube length that doesn't result an image degradation is fine. It's way larger than the two millimeters, except at NA of 0.95. And there the acceptable change in tube length is one millimeter. That doesn't result in uh, a degradation of resolution. You can say, okay, well, the inverted uh, biological microscope, if it's mainly set up for low NA, long working distance uh, uses, then, you know, given that there's prisms in here and relay optics, will this microscope perform as well as an upright, which has a lot less optics in it? It doesn't have these two prisms, doesn't have the relay lenses. And as I'll show, uh, I can get the full uh, optical resolution that you would expect to get from a well-designed upright microscope with this inverted microscope. So uh, it works quite well. So here's my resolution test. I'm using a Helloceta diatom. Uh, pore separation is about 200 nanometers 
and using the uh, NA 1.32 flow tower objective with the hind light ring just outside of the objective NA. You can see I could get the separation in one direction or the other, but I couldn't get them both. Uh, so I uh, saw on the internet that some people suggested that if you put this slide between cross polarizers, you would get an increased contrast. So I put the slide between cross polarizers. I adjusted the hind light ring just at the edge of the objective NA, and then I offset it and then increased the NA of the light ring just a little bit. So I got that little sliver of moon there and I tried different orientations for it. And anyway, I was finally able to get what I consider to be the best I can do uh, with good separation in both directions. And the expected resolution would be uh, 1.22 times the wavelength, which I'm going to assume is 450 nanometers, especially between cross polarizers, because only the blue gets through. And divided by the NA of the objective, which is 1.32, and the NA of the condenser. So that's about 200 nanometers. I took a uh, microscope scale slide and imaged it. It has 10 micron gradations. So using the scale I got with that, I find that the pore to pore distance here to be just about 200 nanometers. So that worked out pretty well. Anyway, this is a long video, but I wanted to say the things I wanted to say about the divert. And I appreciate you watching. Take care.